My name is Aaron Van Devender. I am CEO of Method and investor and board member in Psyquantum. I got pretty interested in quantum computing when I was in high school, partly from initially just watching a lot of Star Trek and being inspired by George LaForge and building technology for the future. So this was in the 90s. There it was not a very large field. There wasn't a lot of people working on it. Um, I don't know. There were probably you know 100 or 200 people who knew what a quantum computer was or what the idea of it was at the time. The universe is quantum, right? And we've been extraordinarily successful using classical computers to model the universe and understand how things work uh, and answer questions about it. But since those computers are classical, the questions that we're asking about are really classical approximations for the computers, for the universe. And like, you know, there's limitations to that. So it seemed pretty clear to me that if we wanted to really get to the heart of it, um, we were going to need a quantum computer to be able to to, to answer those questions. Everybody has sort of, at one time or another, you know, looked up at the night sky and kind of contemplated what's out there and thought about space and time. But very few people that are not physicists um, or mathematicians have really spent much time thinking about the, the, the physics of what is fundamentally knowable. At the time, Terry was really excited about this idea of cluster state quantum computing which was you know, the first really strong attempt to make a scalable measurement-based quantum computing architecture. And it was intuitively super, super different than the kind of gate systems that a lot of other folks were interested in. And I think a lot of people had a really difficult time just acknowledging that how, what, the, what the potential was. And, uh, and a lot of experimentalists were reluctant to maybe build things that looked like um, you know, measurement-based uh, systems, sort of down the line, a lot of those ideas have evolved and fleshed out into the fusion-based quantum computing architecture that uh, PsyQuantum is working on now. You know, a lot of the rest of the field has sort of caught up to the impact of measurement-based systems that you know, even if you have a component that's, uh, uh, that's ions or cold tract atoms um, or superconducting systems, that to be able to take the quantum information, some sort of coherent information that's in, uh, that's in a smaller system and scale it out, you're really going to need a measurement-based system like Fusions uh, to be able to do that. All of the systems that we were really building were using bulk optics. So, you know, we have these big uh, granite stabilized steel honeycomb tables and every single lens and mirror and diffractor and interferometer component has to be bolted on and individually tuned in those th on top of that table. Scaling that thing was just really tedious, unbelievable, monstrous work. And a lot of it had to be done, the operation of it, in pitch dark. So people think, if I have a quantum computer that is based on photons, if I lose a photon, which happens all the time, thing, you know, scattering events happen, you lose photons, then that is really bad because I've just lost some of the quantum information that I'm computing. But and some conversations with, with Terry kind of helped me realize this, that there is, um, that it's actually not nearly as bad as it sounds. If you lose a photon, it's true, you did lose some of your, class, your quantum information, but you gained some classical information because you expected a click over here, a click over here, a detection event, and you didn't receive either. And so you now know deterministically, oh, I have lost a photon. I can take a decisive correcting event and make up for that. And so, you know, losing some quantum information is bad, but you make up for it with some classical information. And on balance, that turns out to be a much better thing than, even though it sort of feels catastrophic, than just losing a small amount of, of quantum information um, without having a, uh, you know, a, a, a way to know about it. Coming to those two realizations where, Okay, ephemerality is actually um, like actually has like a pretty good upside, and two, the integration challenges don't make don't make it worth it. Really convinced me that okay, yes, um, like just going all in on photonic quantum computing, building um, you know integrated planar circuits to be able to uh, to make these systems, and um, uh, you know that that really is that really is the right most most scalable uh, most optimistic approach. 
most of the quantum computing research that had been going on in the, in the United States um, and around the world was funded by IARPA. They had been kind of funding three parallel strategies for how to make a realization. One was superconducting circuits, one was ion traps, one was photonics. Around that time, they decided, okay, you know, we brought these three things as far as we can go. We need to concentrate some of our resources and down select. And so they defunded mostly all of the photonics groups. Terry and Mercedes and Naomi were just totally uh, like unpersuaded by this and did not care at all that it was depopularized and defunded and just decided, you know, they really thought that they knew how to make it work. And so we're going to keep thinking about these ideas of how you could put these photonic circuits together. And this is sort of part of, part of Terry's personality that, you know, a lot of folks are really motivated by like being on the cover of nature and um, getting the getting like publishing the kinds of papers that you think are going to get you the awards and stuff. Terry has just never cared about that. <laughs> you know, both Jeremy and Terry have like, you know, tenured faculty positions at great universities and like big centers and like everything set up. You know, I think a lot of academics who start companies are sort of one foot in, one foot out. Those guys were like, no, we're, this is a hundred, we're a hundred percent. This is what we really want to do. Academia was really just a sort of venue for us to, you know, have a place to, to figure this out and get funding for it. But ultimately, building the quantum computer is the thing that we really care about, not publishing papers or, uh, you know, getting on the cover of magazines or anything like that. Like, we need the quantum computer because that is the important thing to figure out how the universe works. That is why we get up in the morning. That is, that is what we want to do with our lives. And so, like, either, you know, we play to win. There's no half measures. We're going, we're going all in, and and that, um, you know, was 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 really satisfying to me. And and I checked checked a lot of the the things that I was sort of looking for in terms of you know making an investment in quantum computing. Progress in the hardware, in some ways, is pretty predictable, right? You know, in in computing, we have Moore's law that tells us, you know, density of semi of uh, of Semiconductors doubles every two years. And that's been pretty great. And there's sort of something kind of like that. It's not quite as quantitative, but in just in terms of, you know, the capability of the hardware on the quantum side over the last 25 years, it's been kind of sort of predictable. You could sort of see where it was going to go. The thing that has not been predictable is the algorithms and architecture stuff. Because where, where we used to think the goalposts for were, were way further out. Like when we started this, in terms of, um, you know, how many gates we thought we would need to integrate and what the error rates we thought would be correctable or tolerable were much more difficult, much more stringent. But, you know, folks like, like Terry and, and um, uh, like people, just the, the field in general kept coming up with much, much better ways to lower the bar, to, to, you know, to bring the goalposts in, which is something you don't really see very often. Usually, like, as you learn more about it, you realize, oh, this is actually more difficult than we thought and the goalposts are like further away. So that was really exciting for it's like, where it's like, as time goes on, the hardware keeps going, like going up, but the, the software, the algorithms keeps getting better and better. And we keep realizing that there's more and more stuff that we can do with it and more ways that we can get leverage on these quantum systems. And so the convergent place where, you know, where, where we meet, where we're over the bar, right? So where we hit threshold, where the hardware meets the software is sort of getting closer to us in time as we go through. So that was like, um, that was like really exciting. The thing that really convinced me that now was sort of the time to really get in it. I, I think a lot of it was the was Pete's kind of demonstration chip that integrated all of these components together because people had done like showed how the gates should work with the bulk optics and then started integrating like smaller pieces of them and then to say like okay actually we've really sort of reduced to just a single fabrication process, a single chip, like kind of all the key things that we really need to work for it. And I was like, okay, yeah, I mean, like, if you, if you can do that, then, then what else is like, this is not something that we can really sort of fund and continue to develop in academia anymore. We need a, we need a company around this, both in terms of, um, you know, collecting the talent and the IP and the, and the resources and being able to raise enough money to be able to, to be able to do it, you know, between the intelligence agencies and IARPA and NSF and everything have put quite a lot of money into it, but, you know, it was getting to the point where it just really needed, it needed, uh, an, another zero or two, uh, a, a, attached to it in a concentrated way, right? It wasn't where it's like, we can just sort of sprinkle this money around in lots of different groups and it, it, it was just sort of emerge, it'll emerge as a thing where 
now it's like, we really need to solve these things in a coordinated way, in an integrated way. That means doing it in a hierarchical, like within, you know, within a company with a, a, a kind of way instead of like as a field, as a whole. That really convinced me that, 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 it, was, that it was really time. There is a lot of folks at the company, and now it's more than half the company, of folks that did not grow up wanting to build quantum computers and, uh, and work on this stuff. They, they were just like semiconductor engineers that you know, could be working on Apple's next M4 or what, you know, what, like, like that kind of thing. Um, that there are a lot of exciting opportunities in being able to make semiconductors, being able to make silicon photonics, making these kind of devices, making, making you know, big, heavy machines and are choosing like, yeah, this is a practical thing that we can build that, uh, that makes sense in my, in my language and my toolkit and is something that, that we're gonna move forward with. And so being able to get some folks like Faraba, you know, who is a really like no-nonsense person who has delivered some like really hard, hard stuff, hard drives and storage and, and, and chips before. And so, you know, for someone with her caliber to be like, yeah, like, Hey, this is tough, but you know, we've done hard things before. I'm like, this is something that makes sense to me and we, we can deliver this. Like having people like that on the, on, on the team, really excited about it. And, and, and the goals I think is, um, yeah, a really special thing that I think everyone can recognize and be, and be excited about. I mean, the main thing that we have been drumming about forever is the importance of fault tolerance. That unfortunately that is a hard limit. There's no way around it. And we, you know, we kind of, we used to talk about this as the wall, meaning, you know, if you try and do molecular simulations, quantum mechanical simulations on a computer, um, it's like, and you scale it up, it goes from being very trivial to solve on your laptop, very trivial, very trivial, very trivial. And then all of a sudden it's just impossible, your computer's gonna melt down. And, there, and, and the transition point from there is really shocking. People are used to polynomial world, looking in an exponential world is very unintuitive. This is a double exponential world. In a double exponential world, the speed of change once you get near that wall is just really hard to apprehend. But it is the thing that like, you know, makes all the difference in terms of the power. So what I think the thing to really appreciate is like, unless you can really get beyond there and do things in a fault tolerant way, you can publish some nice papers and, and, you, and you can you know, have a good time kind of like thinking about the physics. But in terms of really making an impact on broader industries and kind of up-leveling where humanity is computationally, I think you, you really need to, to get at that. And the appeal of having these um, intermediate places, like value creating places, is really strong. Like, I, you know, I totally get that. You, you would sort of, not knowing anything else about it, you would sort of naturally counsel people to look for uh, things to do like that. But in this case, you just have to look at Think about it for first principles and look through the math and understand like this, this is the reality of the situation. Everything, it's all like fault tolerant or bust. You have to get, you have to get to that scale. You need a million qubits, you need error correction and how it has to work. And once you get that, it's incredibly powerful. Up until that, it's like, don't get around. Having people really pay attention to, is there a credible pathway to a million qubit fault tolerant quantum computer or, or is there not? And you can kind of ignore things that are not logarithmically approaching that. And I and I think in the last in the last sort of maybe year, eighteen months, a lot of other um, folks have really come around to that. But you know, I mean, it's been at least 10, 15 years that kind of everyone on this team has really been just singularly focused on that. So it's a, it's a lot of catch up. Yeah. Well, the things I'm really excited about is um, is the places in biology where there are dynamics. The AI models, I will say, have got started to get good at what we call like sequence from structure. And so, you know, Google's AlphaFold is the kind of best example of this. The, the problem with those models is that they have this sort of static view of, of proteins and molecules as a just a sort of a nature of the, the way that those models work and, and, the, and their approximations. The, the power of the quantum computer is, is the place where, you know, where you have energy levels that are really close together where things are really dynamic and like can move around a lot. And so in my view, like a, mo the most interesting things that are like that, like enzymes, like ribosomes, uh, like transporters, like mitochondria, anything where you have a lot of like energy dynamics that really like kind of powers uh, life and cells more than just this like 
rigid structure kind of thing, I think is really, you know, it's going to be really exciting. And it's also the part of biology that has been least accessible to us in the past. We have, um, you know, gotten okay at designing small molecules that can fit in a little pocket of a, of a, of a protein receptor. That is a very sort of static sort of receptor, um, uh, uh, like structural kind of like problem. Uh, and a lot of like, a lot of big drugs have been made from that. But if you think about the really challenging diseases, mostly tend to be uh, like metabolic diseases and things that have dynamics kind of stuff going on. And, you know, I think we would all like to have more energy and live longer and um, be able to better power our cells. And so being able to like really ask questions and make models um, and, and operate on biology at that at the level of dynamics, I think is super exciting to me and, and something that I am really looking forward to having a quantum computer available to do.